Great. Thank you all very much for joining us. This is Pat Furlong, President and CEO of PPMD, and welcome and happy spring. Hopefully it's sunny where you are today. We're thrilled to be able to talk to you today about uh, Bristol-Myers Squibb, or BMS, study 986089, which is an antimyostatin. Dr. Leslie Jacobson is going to be speaking to you today. Leslie is the medical lead for the Bristol-Myers Squibb antimyostatin, or Ednectin, program. She received her MD from Yale University, and prior to joining the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry in 2008, Leslie worked at the NIH and the Yale School of Medicine on NIH-funded clinical studies in the pediatric population. So she knows pediatrics, which is really wonderful um, from our point of view. Leslie's going to be speaking to you about BMS's anti-myostatin or Ednectin program and about the clinical trials that they're conducting to test in our sons with Duchenne. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Leslie, and thank you, Leslie, and all of BMS for the webinar and for what you're doing for our sons. Leslie? Thank you, Pat, and thank you, PPMD, for allowing us to talk today about our anti-myostatin adnectin, BMS 986089. Um, while I'm going to focus on this molecule today, I'm also going to be referring to a presentation Dr. Lee Sweeney did for um, PPMD um, in November. This webinar is posted on the PPMD website um, and address the antimyostatin mechanism of action. So it's a really um, good source of information about that mechanism of action um, if uh, folks want to learn more about this um, MOA. So first I want to begin with my um, disclosures. I'm a full-time employee of BMS, which makes BMS 986089. I'm going to refer to this uh, molecule as 089 in this presentation. 089 is currently in development as a treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It is not approved for sale in any country. And this presentation today is intended for dissemination and discussion of scientific information only. So 089 is an anti-myostatin adnectin. It's fully human. Um, and it's very, very potent. So it has sub-nanomolar affinity for myostatin. And as a result, we're able to administer doses we expect to be therapeutic using relatively small volumes of drug. And this allows us to give the drug subcutaneously. Um, the dr this uh, drug is being developed as a treatment for Duchenne, and we have initiated a st uh, study this past December in boys with Duchenne, and I'm going to talk more about the, that study um, later in this presentation. First, uh, a few words about myostatin itself. Myostatin is also called GDF8 and is a negative regulator of muscle growth. It was uh, discovered as a novel member of the TGF-beta superfamily of signaling uh, molecules, and removal of the myostatin gene in mice, which is also called knockout, um, produces a, a phenotype of increased body weight, widespread increases in uh, skeletal muscle, decreases in fat mass, increases in bone density, with no increase in cardiac muscle um, or function. So, the myostatin gene sequence and function is conserved across species such that knockout produces a similar phenotype um, across species going from fish all the way up to humans. Um, so given this profile of um, knockout, um, of the effects of knocking out this gene, a number of academic and drug company researchers have considered that this mechanism may be beneficial to patients with muscle wasting disorders such as Duchenne. And this slide shows data from a study conducted by Katherine Wagner in which the histopathology of muscle from three strains of mice was compared. MDX mice on the left, um, which lack dis the dystrophin gene and therefore model, um, model um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, and in the middle, MDX mice who also lacked the myostatin gene. Um, 
um, and these mice are called double knockouts. And the third group they compared is wild-type mice, which have both dystrophin and myostatin. So the top row shows hematoxylin and eosin staining, which highlights the muscle fibers themselves. And you can see that the MDX mice that have myostatin actually have fewer muscle fibers that are smaller. When myostatin is removed, the muscle fibers are larger, and they actually start to look more like the normal muscle fibers in the wild-type animal. The lower row shows um, staining for fibrosis using trichrome stain staining that stains fibrosis blue. And in the MDX column showing tissue from MDX mice that make myostatin, you can see extensive fibrosis in the muscle um, tissue. When myostatin is removed, um, this improves. The, my the fibrosis is reduced, and obviously it's minimal in the wild-type animal. Similar results are seen in dog, uh, dogs that don't make dystrophin, so the dog model of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy has also been examined and shows uh, similar tissue differences um, associated with, with treatment with an antimyostatin antagonist. This is um, all, uh, functional data from, or, or pharmacodynamic data from the study by Wagner and col colleagues. And on the left are um, plots of weight um, of, the, um, of the MDX mice that make myostatin. And those are shown in purplish blue. And on the um, and in and in this graph, um, the MDX mice that don't make myostatin are shown in red. So um, the left graph shows that um, myostatin knockout produced um, improvements in weight, increases in weight. Um, and on the right um, are measures of forearm grip strength, and these data show that removal of myostatin produced increases in forearm grip strength across the board and um, that this effect was prolonged in the animals. And these are data finally that show the effect of treating MDX mice with an antimyostatin antibody treatment. Um, just a second. Uh, so these animals uh, received weekly subcutaneous treatment for three months with an antimyostatin antibody. And in this um, set of data, the um, MDX mice that are treated with placebo are in blue, and the MDX mice that are treated with the antimyostatin antagonist are, are shown in red. The far left graph, um, this graph, shows that weight improved in these animals when they were treated with the antimyostatin antagonist or a antibody. This graph showing muscle strength shows that um, muscle strength was improved with antimyostatin treatment. Rotorod performance is a measure of activity, and this too was seen to improve with antimyostatin treatment of the MDX mice. And finally, serum creatine kinase was reduced in the MDX mi mice that were treated with the antimyostatin antibody to a range that was actually similar to um, what is observed in wild-type mice. Creatine kinase in these animals is a me measure of muscle breakdown. And so it appears that muscle breakdown was being improved by this treatment. I'm going to now move to um, some uh, a description of our preclinical safety and pharmacodynamic efficacy data for um, BMS 986089. 089 um, has been tested in um, rat and monkey in chronic toxicology studies, as well as in um, uh, male rat juvenile toxicology studies. And in all of these studies, uh, the 089 was safe and well tolerated. Um, notably and importantly, in the juvenile uh, rat study, increases in body and leg muscle weight 
uh, and dose-dependent increases in bone mineral content and density were observed. We believe that this is, or this is understood to be on-target pharmacology, meaning evidence of the drug actually having efficacy. And similarly, in the six-month and rat month, um, six-month rat and monkey chronic studies, increases in muscle volume were observed with treatment um, with 089, and these were measured using MRI of these animals. And in the rat, the leg muscle volume increased up to 15%, whereas in the monkey, it increased up to 5%. Um, next, I'm going to uh, present some preliminary phase one safety PK and pharmacodynamic efficacy data in healthy adults. Um, this study was just completed, um, and so these data are, are preliminary. This was a single and multiple ascending dose study in healthy adults, and um, our preliminary findings are that single and multiple weekly subcutaneous doses of up to 180 milligrams of 089 appear to be safe and well tolerated. The most common adverse effect we observed were, was mild injection site er erythema or redness and rash and injection site reaction. I just want to note here that the, these adverse effects were very mild. They did not require treatment or cessation of study drug, and they resolved completely and spontaneously. Uh, further increases in thigh muscle volume were observed in the multiple ascending dose phase, and I'm going to show those data in a few slides. These two graphs graphs depict the pharmacokinetic and free myostatin data from the single ascending dose phase of the study. The left graph shows PK data where serum PK con concentrations or serum concentrations of 089 uh, peaked three to five days after dosing. Concentrations increased proportionally with increasing doses of um, up to 90 milligrams and then greater than pro dose proportionally at higher doses. In the right graph, you can see plots of free myostatin as a percentage of baseline, and um, uh, you can see that with increasing doses, which, by the way, are coded in um, by color, um, uh, free myostatin was uh, uh, the magnitude of suppression of free myostatin increased, as well as the duration increased, um, the duration of suppression increased. So this graph depicts the changes in thigh muscle uh, volume that we observed using MRI. Subjects in the multiple ascending dose phase were scanned at baseline before dosing and on study days 29 and 57. In this study, all subjects received five doses of study drugs. So um, day 29 was their last dose of study drug. And in this figure, dose group is again indicated by color, and the percentages indicate the percent suppression of free myostatin at each time point for each dose. And what can be seen in this figure is that for doses of 45 milligrams and above, we observed a roughly 4.5% increase in muscle volume relative to baseline, and this roughly corresponded to the magnitude of free myostatin suppression. Now, all of these subjects also underwent um, uh, dual, dual X-ray absorptiometry scan, scanning to measure total lean body mass. These data aren't shown, but um, what we did observe is, is that lean body mass also increased um, at day 57 in subjects receiving doses of 45 milligrams per week or more. So in summary, from our phase one study, we um, find that uh, BMS 089 is safe and well tolerated in single and weekly multiple subcutaneous doses of up to 180 milligrams. Exposure increased roughly dose proportionally, and extent and duration of free myostatin suppression increased with dose. 
And finally, treatment with five weekly doses of 45 milligrams or more of BMS um, 986089 was associated with increases in thigh muscle volume and total lean body mass in healthy adults. So um, the last part of this presentation will be about the study in Duchenne that we have just started. This study is a multi-site, randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind, ascending, weekly subcutaneous dose study to, to assess safety and tolerability of 089 in ambulatory boys with Duchenne. And there's uh, two uh, broad phases. There's an, um, a 24-week double-blind phase where uh, patients are randomized to either 089 or placebo, and this is followed immediately by a 48-week open-label phase where everyone receives 089. Um, this is an outpatient study, and we have sites that are open and active in both the United States and in Canada, and we are offering travel, travel support for this study. The primary objective of the study is to assess safety and tolerability of multiple subcutaneous doses of 089 in boys with Duchenne. Um, we also want to evaluate pharmacokinetics, or PK, immunogenicity, free myostatin and myostatin drug complex. And we are obtaining MRI and MRS scans um, to measure thigh muscle, fat, and lipid fraction in this study. We are targeting to enroll at least 40 ambulatory boys with Duchenne um, from five up to 11 years of age at the time of randomization. All patients in the study will receive weekly subcutaneous doses of study drug during the double-blind phase, and that will be either 089 or placebo. Um, and the double-blind phase is 24 weeks long. Upon completing the double-blind phase, all subjects will enter the open-label phase, and that will happen immediately. In the open-label phase, all subjects will receive 089 um, weekly, subcutaneously, for 48 weeks. Once subjects complete the open-label phase, they may be offered the opportunity to enroll in a separate open-label rollover treatment study protocol if appropriate and if BMS continues to develop 089. This slide lists our key inclusion and exclusion criteria. For this study, we are targeting boys with a diagnosis of Duchenne that's confirmed by medical history and by genotyping. Um, Boys need to be ambulatory and between the ages of 5 and 11 years of age. So boys that turn 11 before the day of randomization are not eligible. Um, uh, we are seeking boys who are, have been on corticosteroids for at least six months prior to initiation of study drug with the dose being stable for three months, at least three months prior to the initiation of study drug. And we are including patients who are on daily as well as intermittent dosing regimens, as long as it's stable. Um, boys need to be able to climb four stairs in eight seconds or less and must have an ejection fraction of 55% or greater me as measured by echocardiogram. Um, Patients in the study need to be able to cooperate and, and complete the study procedures and um, treatment with Adalurin or any investigational drug within three months or five half-lives prior to the start of study drug is not allowed. And we are asking that um, boys be allowed to recover from major surgery for at least six weeks prior to starting study drug. Uh, in terms of what this, the study um, involves, um, it will involve uh, weekly subcutaneous dosing. After the third dose, dosing at home is possible. Um, 
and I'm going to talk a tiny bit about how that works. So caregivers who wish to dose at home will be trained to administer study drug at the clinic during the first three dose, dosing doses. Um, there's also a visiting nurse uh, service that we have engaged and this support is available to help with study drug administration at home at sites that permit this service. Uh, other procedures include um, collection of vital signs, physical exam, electrocardiogram, echocardiogram, blood draws, imaging studies, and measures of function, including the time function test, the six minute walk test, and the North Star Ambulatory Assessment Scale. Um, anyone who wants to learn more about the study can visit the Bristol Myers Squibb Study Connect Patient Caregiver Portal to subscribe for updates on this study and other DMD studies that we'll be conducting. Um, and this is the website here, or you can go to clinicaltrials.gov in particular to get, um, at either site you can get up-to-date information about um, sites that are um, active in the United States and Canada. In addition, um, you may uh, call or email Bristol Myers Squibbs, Squibb at the phone number and email address listed below. And finally, uh, we especially want to thank the patients and families who are participating in our study now, as well as the advocacy and research organizations and research groups who've provided um, in information that's helped us to um, get this program started and design this study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Leslie. This is um, Kathy Kinnett with PPMD. So we have had a couple of questions, and um, I'll just start to ask them if that's okay with you. Sure. So, so if I'm a mom and I'm trying to decide whether or not to participate in this study, um, one of the things that I would be asking is how frequent are the visits? And I know they're more frequent during the first six weeks, but Maybe if you could elaborate on um, what that frequency means. Um, sure. So <clears throat> there, <clears throat> excuse me. There is an initial screening period where up to three visits occur, and then during the first six weeks, there um, are approximately. Um, well, I know during the first week there's three visits, and then somewhat less frequent weekly, and then after six weeks. Their, the visits are every six weeks. Okay. So it would be you would need to be close or somewhere accessible to the site for at least the first three weeks probably? Um, and then I think actually what um, um, families are doing is they're being close by uh, for the first, well, for, for Screening, they'll come for, you know, a, a, um, a couple of days for the screening, and then they come back to start, and that would, um, they're usually there for the first week or two, mm -hmm. and then they can go home and then come back. Okay. Now, some of the visits after that first three weeks can occur at home if mm -hmm. the visiting nurse service is allowed by the site, and that's another option. Okay, and then how, after that first six weeks, how often would they have to come back to the actual center? Every six weeks. Every six weeks, okay. Okay, and once this, so you're on the open label, and then how long would you think that my child would have access to the study medication? Right, so um, the um, open label phase is 48 weeks. And after that, we're um, tentatively planning to initiate an open label rollover study, and that will depend on, you know, wh whether we do that depends on whether on on the the findings from these initial studies in terms of safety and efficacy, and uh, and of course um, whether we continue to uh, develop the drug. Okay, so that has that's yet to be determined. At this point, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And I know that this is available and appropriate for all mutations, um, alteration mutations. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Have you started to look at this 
drug and other muscle wasting disorders, or are there plans to potentially do that in the future? So right now we're focusing on Duchenne, and once I think we get you know further into this program and have a better understanding of of you know the efficacy and dose, we're will be then considering other muscle wasting disorders. Okay, so at this time we're you're concentrating on Duchenne with the potential to expand to other. Exactly. Yes. Right. Okay. Okay. So if I'm thinking about whether or not to enroll in this study, what do you think the biggest safety risk to be would be to my child if I if we did choose to enroll? So this is a really important topic to talk about with the physician at the study site. So um, uh, potential uh, subjects who are and families who are inter are considering p participating can have that important discussion with the site PI, but what, what we know at this point is that 089 has been safe and well tolerated in animal studies and in health, uh, healthy adults, with the most common adverse effect being the mild injection site redness or erythema or rash that I referred to. Um, and again, um, these um, cutaneous or skin um, reactions haven't required treatment or cessation of study drug and have resolved completely um, on their own. So we feel in total that the weight of the evidence is that 089 will be safe in boys with Duchenne. In the current study, we're really carefully observing the patients and increasing doses very slowly to ensure that um, the participants stay safe and well. Okay. And you mentioned imaging as part of, of as part of the, the protocol and muscle imaging. Is cardiac imaging involved as well or is uh, cardiac echo was mentioned? Is, but we, there was a question about cardiac MRI. Right. So this the cardiac MRI is not being um, included in this study. We're measuring um, um, cardiac function using echocardiogram in this study. Okay, but not cardiac MRI at this time? That's correct. Okay. And if my son is on an ACE inhibitor at the beginning of the trial, I would assume that that would be allowed as long as the yes. injection fraction was above 55%? That's correct, yes. Yeah. So um, ACE inhibitors or other treatments or prophylaxis for heart failure are allowed as long as the dose has been stable for three months, at least three months prior to start of study drug. And the same is true for medications that are used to treat low, low bone mineral density, such as bisphosphonates. Okay. In the event that my child would need to start on a cardiac med during the trial, would that alter? Um, no, they would, they would start. The, yeah, the um, priority is patient safety, so they would start their cardiac medication if that was needed, and they would stay in our study. Okay. And are there any evaluations of muscle function um, in this study? Yeah, so there are um, the evaluations I mentioned on the slide, including the time function tests, um, six-minute walk test, and the um, North Star ambulatory assistant assessment, as well as others like myometry. Okay, and if my child's muscle function declined to the point that he maybe need to start needing a wheelchair during the study, what, would that affect his involvement in the trial? No, he would stay in the trial. Okay. We all know that um, Atoplosin is uh, being reviewed right now by the FDA. And if this medication is approved, uh, would that drug be allowed as a concomitant medication in this study or this trial? Right, because um, the safety profile of atepleurcin is not well understood at this time. Um, we are, and we're in the early stages of gathering safety data for 089. We would not allow atepleurcin to be uh, used in, in this study. So it would not be allowed. Okay. And any other drugs that people may be on, um, as far as study drugs, are allowed for a washout period prior to enrolling in this study, correct? Yes. Yeah. And that was three months, I think, or five half lives? Right. Okay. All right. Um, most P 
people we know in this age group are going to be on corticosteroids. Um, is there a possibility that you may be not using or testing this drug in a population that's not using corticosteroids? Yeah, so we we are – that's under active discussion, and, and the team is actively thinking about those next steps. So, yeah, that – again, that's one of those things that's um, – we're, we're thinking about it, and the um, you know once we understand how this drug works in Duchenne boys on corticosteroids, what the appropriate dose is, we'll be um, making those plans firmer. And what about non-ambulatory patients, Leslie? Yeah, same thing. We we have we have um, a commitment to Duchenne, and this would include non-ambulatory patients. Um, but those studies would would be initiated after this initial study, and certainly on the basis of seeing, um, you know, understanding the dose that we need to be using in patients with Duchenne. Okay. Can you talk maybe just a little bit about muscle satellite cells and the effect of this medication on the muscle satellite cells, whether it would decrease the number of satellite cells Right. So this is um, a question that has come up based on some animal um, studies in the literature that um, actually haven't been replicated. So the literature at this point is mixed, and the majority of the more recent um, animal studies in living animals have shown that increases in muscle volume produced by the anti-myostatin approach occur without changes in satellite number. So, uh, and f further, we've seen no evidence of satellite cell depletion in our preclinical toxicology studies. So we feel um, clear that this is uh, not a significant risk. Of course, we're monitoring the boys very, very closely in all of our studies. So one of the questions that we have received from the audience um, mentions that uh, the muscle increase, so the, the increase in muscle volume from day 30 to day 57. Um, how do you, can you explain how you think that may have happened? So myostatin increases the size of existing muscle, muscle fibers. So, so it works on muscle fibers that are there by increasing their size. And that's how that increasing increase is occurring. Okay, I may not have understood that question quite exactly. Um, if, if, if sort of explain a little bit about what the difference is between enlarged muscles with pseudohypertrophy and Duchenne and enlarged muscles increases in muscle mass and volume with this drug. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. Um, um, Many know that um, in Duchenne, some of the muscles get larger, and this is called pseudohypertrophy. And um, imaging studies have shown that the pseudohypertrophic muscle of Duchenne includes muscles as well as fat and fibrotic tissue, and the latter are not contractile. They're not going to help with the muscle doing its work. The antimyostatin mechanism in, increases the um, size of the contractile muscle tissue. So that change should, that increase should support uh, improved contractile for, force or improved function. Is that helpful? I think so, yes. So we've all seen the questions, or the, 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 the uh, slide, sorry, of the, the cows that have um, the giant muscles. So. How can we be assured that patients' muscles won't become as grossly enlarged? Right. Yeah. So that's a um, that that's a very good question, um, and those those pictures can be alarming. Um, <laughs> and I can imagine. Um, so uh, important things to understand about those pic uh, those animals is that they have never had myostatin number one, and number two, they all have dystrophin. So they're very different from the situation where um, of Duchenne. When the anti-myostatin mechanism is applied to a Duchenne model, um, it actually normalizes the, the muscle more or less. I mean, it increases the muscle, but it doesn't make it enlarged beyond 
normal. It doesn't produce a supra large muscle. So would we be we would be normalizing this muscle rather than making it grow beyond its normal means. Exactly. Okay. And you mentioned that it doesn't affect the heart muscle. So can you talk a little bit while, about why that would be a, a positive or negative effect? Right. So by that we mean there's no, we've not seen any evidence of it enlarging the heart. You know, one would be concerned about that. And um, that, you know, the, the heart muscle um, appears to be unaffected. Um, so that that's a, a positive in the sense that you would not want the heart to get larger per se. Because a, a heart that's too large isn't able to function appropriately. Yeah, is that, right. Well, oh, there was okay. concern about that that happening. If it did, that, um, you know, there there would be um, potentially an adverse effect on the heart, and we mm -hmm. have evidence of that. And this is um, another thing we're following closely, of course, in, in the boys. Okay. That makes sense, um, and you're following that with echo at this moment. Correct. Okay. Um, there was a question about iron overload with this drug. Could you talk a little bit about why that could potentially be a problem and why it's not with this with this drug? Yeah, so um, iron overload is something that we have not seen any evidence of um, further Consistent with that, we, we don't see any evidence of increased iron absorption in animals or in humans. Um, so we aren't, you know, um, we, we don't feel that there is a significant risk. Of course, we're monitoring safety, um, mm -hmm. but the study doesn't include, I mean, the, the gold standard monitoring for iron overload is liver MRI. And uh, that is not a requirement for this study because we um, we don't have an increased risk per se. We and we're monitoring, you know, uh, for increases or changes in iron absorption using serum markers instead. Okay. So because you haven't seen the evidence of iron overload in the blood, you don't feel that there's any reason to value or continue to watch for iron overload in the liver. Yeah. So there's there. It's, little bit more uh, nuance. Um, so no evidence, no reason to, um, to to think that iron absorption would be changed given mm -hmm. the specificity of our molecule. Um, so and no evidence in animals and no evidence in the healthy adult study. Got it. Okay. And you all have started enrolling, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And how many? Can you talk a little bit about how many sites you have and um, numbers of people that you're enrolling, and right. we can cover that a little bit. Yeah, so we're um, targeting a total of um, 15 sites in the United States and Canada, um, and most of them are open um, with a few additional ones that will be opened in the United States um, and in Canada um, this, this month and next month. I mean, sorry, April and, and May. Um, and our ultimate target is at least 40 patients. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 40 patients? Okay. And how many have you enrolled now? Um, well, I, um, the last I saw is that we enroll, have enrolled eight. Okay. All right. So it's coming along. Yes. Okay. Um, let me make sure that I have everybody's questions. So there was one question about the little guys, and one of your um, study uh, requirements is that you're able to comply with the study, um, the requirements of the study. Are there any protocols or any anything that accounts for little guys with maybe a five-year-old attention span? Right, so our minimum age is five. You can be five and be in the study, and and um, we do have um, some some little guys who've come in and they've done great. Um, but so so I, I I think, but everyone knows, you know, under the best of circumstances, a five year you know five year old vary a <laughs> completely normal. Right, um, and they can also vary across days. So um, in terms of the screening and many of the procedures, you know, you can. 
if if it's a bad day, you can come back and, and repeat some, some some if not all of the procedures if if need be. Of course, you don't always want to do that, but you know we have tried to pace the measurements so that it's not overwhelming for young younger folks, um, and it it does appear that. Um, you know uh, that that young kids can get through this quite well. Excellent. So you feel that the protocol is appropriate for that age patient, but there's a little bit of leniency if somebody's having a five-year-old day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, and and but I know that there are some also some five-year-olds who who can't make it through. You know, um, uh, we have, so some kids um, even on the best day may not be able to make it through. Um, and that's that's unfortunate, but um, that's the way this currently this protocol is is designed. Okay. And if a child is ten when they enroll, but they'll turn eleven soon, it's fine as long as they're less than eleven when they enroll. Exactly. It actually less than eleven on the day of randomization. Okay. So you can Leslie, turn, you oh, go ahead. turn eleven the next day, and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you meet the requirements that day. Yeah, yeah. So do you feel that this drug might be expected to stop deterioration in muscle strength or, or actually to help regain any function? Oh, that's a or do we not know yet? Really good question. We don't know yet. It's theoretically possible that it could do both, um, but this is the, the very question we're extremely keen to answer ourselves and what we'll be looking for closely in, in the data as it comes out. Okay. And we know that some of the boys that are on steroids have weight issues, but you're evaluating lean body mass as well as weight? Yes. We're, we're primarily in evaluating lean body mass. Um, it, it, so weight we are measuring as well, but more to ensure that the doses are appropriate because you know there's a huge range of weights. So um, weight in in the uh, Duchenne studies and the boys is not being used as a a measure of efficacy or pharmacodynamic activity per se. Mm -hmm. So the first phase is a dose finding. Yeah, um, it's dose as well. escalation. Yeah, so there's a first, there's an initial dose escalation piece. Where we're, you know, starting off at the lowest dose and then going up higher to to make sure that it's safe and well tolerated before we go up. So for that first phase, you'll be finding the the best dose, and then when the boys roll off of the placebo and onto the dose, onto the drug, uh, will you then know what dose, or will that be a, a distribute? Will those boys be distributed across doses? Yeah. So that is your. Um, just to clarify, you're talking about when they transition to the open label phase, what is the dose that we would be using? And currently the plan is that they would um, roll over to the dose that um, they were originally assigned to within their panel. Um, but that is something that we would be evaluating as data comes in. And if we need to, we would adjust that if we think that there's a better dose for okay. patients to be on. All right, so here's a, this might be a tricky question, but in the age of social media, uh, because you you have seen some fight reactions in healthy volunteers, are you at all concerned about the ability to keep the first 24 weeks blinded? Yeah, so um, we, you know, we stayed blinded in the healthy adult study. So the, the reactions were mild enough that it wasn't, Obvious, but I, I I understand what you mean. It would be, um, you know, it, it may unblind the site. Um, one one thing that needs to be acknowledged here is that if if you know the boys being on corticosteroids may mitigate expression of this. You know, they mm -hmm. may not have as much rash as we observed in the healthy adult study. We're not sure. Um, but if certainly if that's the case, it would um, it would mitigate or, or reduce the the incidence and potential unblinding. Okay. Um, 
And what percentage of your healthy volunteers had injection site reactions? Um, it was... About. Right. Uh, you know, we just locked the database, so I, I'm not comfortable answering. It was, oh, um, fine. you know, I, I would rather wait till we get the final data, just because I, I could say a number and it wouldn't be exactly right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, that's fine. Oh, no, you're fine. But we just wondered if it was a small number, if it was a large number, or... It was a medium number. <laughs> a medium number. I like that. That's it's good. Okay. The middle, um, yeah, the middle beer. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Um, if, patients, if patients are on growth hormone, would this exclude them from your study? Yeah, they would need to come off of growth hormone and be washed off of that, yes. And would that be three months as well, probably, or five half-lives? Yeah. Same as study of other drugs? Yeah. Okay. Um, and do you have plans to open sites outside of U.S. and Canada? Are there is there a global plan for this trial? Not for this trial. The global We are planning a global study that will start early next year that would involve sites outside of the U.S. and Canada. It would be a global study. Okay. So after this study, then it will be expanded. Uh, yeah, but it's it's going to be a separate study, very similar mm -hmm. design and global. Okay. I think that concludes my questions. Is there anything else that you think that we haven't covered that you all would like to share? Um, let me just look through my list of things that have been asked before. I think you've done a great job, uh, Kathy. Um, the one question that did come up before is about supplements, and we have, uh, a, you know, I know that these are really common, um, mm -hmm. and some of them are allowed, and it's sort of um, a, an evolving, you know, because as we learn more about what supplements kids are taking, we, we look through, uh, we, we consider each one carefully. So that's a discussion to have with the site PI who is coordinating with us um, with respect to the list of allowable supplements. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Okay. That's a really good point. Um, and there are other molecule, molecules that are in development for antimyostatin. Can you say at all how this might differ or how patients should consider um, right. this antimyostatin? So, um, good question because there are um, we don't actually have detailed information about other myostatins in development, so it's really hard to make a direct comparison. It's impossible. Um, what we can report is our study of healthy adults show that 089 dosed weekly subcutaneously is, is uh, safe and well tolerated and produces a dose-dependent robust reduction in myostatin um, that seems to correlate with changes in muscle. Okay, that's a fair answer. Um, one other question. So since this drug's been projected to help everyone, um, is there a reason that you want – what's the interaction between the steroids and this drug that would that would make you think that it was a good idea for people to be on steroids as well as this antimyostatin? Right. So, yeah, we're asking that um, patients in the study be on stable doses of steroids. And the reason for that is that – um, the standard of care for boys with Duchenne is corticosteroid treatment. So everyone in the age range that we're targeting with this initial study who are ambulatory will be on them. Um, and they have, it for good reason, they're robustly efficacious. That's been shown very clearly. What we're doing, though, is asking that the steroid um, be um, stable and not recent. So we're saying you need to have been on it for six months with a stable dose for three uh, three months at least. So that changes, immediate changes related to changes in steroid regimen aren't happening anymore. And so you have a relatively stable ba background against we, which we add the myostatin or placebo and then can hopefully measure efficacy off of that. Okay. That makes perfect sense. So um, we know that this will result in increased muscle growth. Is it, has there been evidence that this muscle growth has been symmetric across the body? So we um, have no evidence 
to suggest otherwise. That's what I could okay. say, although um, that obviously would be a significant concern and it's something we're we're watching. Okay. But if this is a systemically absorbed drug that... Right. It's not going into a muscle. It's going into the subcutaneous tissue from which it then goes into circulation. So it should affect all muscles equally. Exactly, yeah. All muscles would be equally exposed. Okay. I think I have asked all the questions, Leslie. I don't think I have anything else. Um, so, I, so thank. I'm seeing a um, a question here. Okay. A couple of questions. Um, is a debidone allowed? Um, and the answer is no. Mm -hmm. um, a debidone is not approved. Is and. Um, did the mice, adult humans, et cetera, suffer any withdrawal or side effects once the drug was stopped? And the answer is no, they did not. Um, and then what dose week is the study at presently with Adrian Roll? The study would have panel one and two half full. So we're, we filled panel one. Okay. Um, how can you talk about a little bit about how this drug might be different from the myostatin inhibitors being sold as supplements for muscle growth? Are you familiar uh, with those at all? I'm so can you say that again? I don't think I understood. How is the muscle how is this drug different from the myostatin inhibitors being sold as supplements from muscle growth? Oh, I don't know about those. I, I so oh. I couldn't I couldn't say. I, okay. I, sir, are, are you saying they're being like sold in vitamin stores or something? Or that—that's my assumption from this question. Yes, that oh. you can buy them online, maybe. I'm not aware. Um, yeah, I, I'm not aware of what those are, so I, I wouldn't be able to comment. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Okay, that's fair. I'm not. Do you see any other questions that I'm not seeing? Um, I'm just looking. Okay. I think yeah, I, I don't think so. I think we've addressed um addressed them. Uh, you know, okay. most of them, so thanks. Okay, so I think that uh people who are interested should uh talk with their um neuromuscular providers who have access to the exact protocol that discusses visits and procedures at each visit. Um, would you add any more to that? Uh, no, no, thank you. That's that's a good summary. Leslie, this is Kimberly. I wonder if you could um, put back the screen that has the um, web the website address and contact numbers. Oh, that way, sure. at least folks can. Oops. Have that as we sign off. Yes. There you go. All right. Thank you all so much for presenting this material. It's been extremely helpful and very interesting. And I know that everybody um, that, that was able to participate and, and, and view this live appreciates it. And then we will have it up for others to can view it later. So thank you all very much. Thank you. This concludes our webinar. Thanks.